Hi. I'm going to talk to you about the optimism bias, which is a cognitive illusion I've been studying in my lab for the past few years. It's a human tendency to overestimate our likelihood of experiencing positive events in our lives and underestimating the likelihood of experiencing negative events. So for example, we overestimate our longevity, our career prospects, we underestimate our likelihood of suffering from cancer, being in a car accident. In short, most of us are more optimistic than realistic, but we're not aware of it. Take marriage, for example. In the Western world, out of five couples walking down the aisle, at least two will end up divorced, and that's about 40%. But when you ask newlyweds about their own likelihood of divorce, they estimate it at 0%. And even divorce lawyers, who should really know better, hugely underestimate their own likelihood of divorce. Now, it turns out optimists are not less likely to divorce but they are more likely to remarry. In the words of Samuel Johnson, remarriage is a triumph of hope over experience. <laughs> now, if you're married, statistically, you're more likely to have kids, and we all believe that our kids will be especially talented. This, by the way, is my two-year-old nephew, Guy, and I just want to make it clear that he's a really bad example of the optimism bias because he is uniquely talented. And I'm not alone. Out of four British people, three said that they were optimistic about the future of their own families. That's 75%. But only 30% said that they're optimistic about families in general. And that's a really important point, because we're optimistic about ourselves, we're optimistic about our kids, we're optimistic about our families, but we're not so optimistic about the guy sitting next to us. And we're somewhat pessimistic about the future of our country and the future of our leaders. But private optimism about our own personal future, that remains quite persistent. And it's a global phenomenon. Now, I'm a scientist. I do experiments. So I'm going to do an experiment here with you. I'm going to give you a list of abilities and characteristics. And for each one of these, I'm going to ask you to think where you stand relative to other people, OK? So the first one is getting along well with others. Who here believes they're at the bottom 25% for getting along well with others? Just put your hand up. OK, almost no one. Who believes they're at the top 25% for getting along well with others? OK, that's most of us here. Now, do the same for your driving ability. How interesting are you? How attractive are you? How honest are you? And finally, how modest are you? <laughs> most people put themselves above average on most of these abilities. They're even willing to bet money on it. We can't all be better than everyone else, but if we believe we are, that means we believe the, that we have the ability, um, we're more attractive, more social, more interesting, and therefore we're more likely to get that promotion, to remain married. And as I said, it's, it's a global phenomenon. It's something that we find in the Western world, but also in non-Western cultures, in females, in males, uh, even in non-human animals. But the question that was always surprising to me was, how do we maintain optimism in the face of reality? I mean, we go through life experiencing not only positive events, but also negative events. We experience heartache and failure. We read the newspapers. We know that the economy is going down. And still, we remain quite optimistic. As a neuroscientist, this was especially confusing because according to all the theories out there, if your expectations are not met, you should alter them. And this eventually would lead to realism and certainly not to optimism. So to try and figure out what was going on, my colleagues and I conducted experiments in our lab at University College London. And from those experiments, what we've learned was that people learn much more from positive information that they receive about the future than from negative information. 
So for example, if someone was to say, I think that my likelihood of suffering from cancer is about 50%. And we would say, good news, the average likelihood is much better, it's 30%. Well, next time around, they tend to say, well, maybe my likelihood is only 35%. So they learn quite quickly and efficiently. But if someone started off saying, my likelihood of suffering from cancer, I think, is about 10%, and we said, bad news, the average likelihood for someone like you is much worse, it's 30%, the next time around, they would say, yeah, I still think my likelihood is about 11%. So it's not that they didn't learn at all, but they learned much less than when they got good news. And what this means is that when you see warning signs such as these, you think to yourself, yes, smoking kills, but mostly it kills the other guy. But when you hear that the housing market is going up, you think, oh, my house will definitely double in price. And it's not only about how we learn of the future, but also about how we learn of ourselves. In a study that was conducted by two behavioral economists, Il and Raoul, they had people come into their lab in group of 10, and they asked them to estimate everyone on how attractive they were, from the least attractive number one to the most attractive number 10. And then each person had to say how attractive they thought them themselves were. So let's say someone said, I'm about average on attractiveness. But then they heard that everyone else believed that they were much more attractive than that. Well, the next time around, they would say, well, maybe I'm much more attractive than I thought. So they changed their perception quite easily. But if someone started off saying, I'm about average attractiveness, and then learned that everyone else thought they were much less attractive, they would change their mind just a little bit, not as much. So they would say, well, attractiveness is something subjective. My mom thinks I'm attractive. And what this means is that we might then end, end with a perception of this of ourselves. Now, all of these experiments were done on college students. So you might say, well, college students are young, they're delusional. As we grow older, we gain more experience, and surely we become more realistic. Well, we decided to test that. So we conducted our experiments on different people of different ages, on kids, on teenagers, college students, and elderly individuals. And what we found was that across all of these groups, everyone learned from good news about the same. It didn't matter if you're 10 years old, 30 years old, or 80 years old, Everyone learned from good news quite well. But when it came to bad news, it did matter how old you were. Kids and teenagers didn't learn from bad news as well as middle-aged people. So as we grow older, we gain the ability to learn from bad news. And it reaches um, the, the top ability at around 40 years old. But then it starts to deteriorate as we grow older. Now, we found this pattern especially interesting because when you look at how happiness and life satisfaction changes with age, you see the exact mirror image. So happiness starts deteriorating from the time you're a teenager, hitting rock bottom at about age 40, and then miraculously it goes up again. Now, it depends on where you stand on this curve, but I find these data extremely encouraging because it means that happiness is just around the corner. This data is collected by the behavioral economist Andrew Oswald um, from more than a half a million people in more than 70 countries around the world. And in almost all of these countries, he found this U-shaped curve of how happiness changes with age. But there were a few differences between the different countries especially at what age people hit rock bottom. So in the UK, for example, people tended to hit rock bottom at around age 37. But in the US, they wouldn't reach their lowest point until a decade later at around the age of 47. And in Italy, it didn't happen until they were about 66 years old. 
And in Mexico, they were smack in the middle at around age 40, they would reach the lowest point in their life. So we didn't test how the ability to learn from bad news is related to happiness, but we did test how the ability to learn from bad news is related to clinical depression. And we found that people with depression are actually much better at learning from bad news about the future than healthy individuals. So what we wanted to know was what was going on inside the depressed brain that allows people to learn from negative information about the future, but did not allow it in the healthy brain. So we conducted a brain imaging study. So our participants lie in a scanner like this, and they estimate their likelihood of experiencing all kinds of negative events, and then we give them information about those events, and we test their estimate later on to see if they learn from that information. And using a method called functional MRI, we are able to detect parts of the brain that were responding to good news. One of these regions is called the left inferior frontal gyrus, it's about here, and it was responding to good news. So if someone learned, uh, said, my likelihood of suffering from cancer is about 50%, and we said good news, average likelihood is about 30%, this region will respond quite fiercely. And it didn't matter if you're an extreme optimist, a mild optimist, or slightly pessimistic, or even depressed. Everyone's left in fear of frontal gyrus was doing quite a good job. Now, on the other side of the brain, the right in fear of frontal gyrus was responding to negative news. And it wasn't doing a very good job. And the more optimistic you were, the less likely this region was to integrate negative inter information into your beliefs. Now, if this region is not responding to negative information, you will fail to learn from bad news and will constantly keep your row spectacles on. So we wanted to know whether we can change this. Could we alter people's bias by changing the activity of these brain regions? And there's a way for us to do that. This is my collaborator at UCL, Riata Kanei. And what he's doing is he's passing a small magnetic pulse through the scalp of this participant into his left inferior frontal gyrus. And by doing that, we're able to interfere with the activity of this brain region for about half an hour. After that, everything goes back to normal, I assure you. So when we did that, we found that people's bias disappear their ability to learn from bad news would then equal to their ability to learn from good news. Now here's a question. If you could eliminate the optimism bias using different methods and in different environments, would you want to do that? Well, I believe that humans have evolved this optimism bias because on balance, the positive, sub, op, the positive outcomes of optimism is greater than the negative outcomes. And optimism has been related to better physical health and mental health. Optimism is related to achievement in different domains. But there are also pitfalls. Underestimating the risks out there may make you less likely to take precautionary actions, like going to medical screenings or putting on a helmet. And so the hope is that by studying the human brain, we will be able to identify methods to enhance the optimism bias in groups of people who lack it and need it, but at the same time, identify ways to protect ourselves from the downfalls. Thank you. <laughs>